sometimes they can interact with stuff that's in your belly. So if you have like a an empty belly and you've been fasted for I like I said I prefer like a day, 16 hours at the least, but if you can if you can be fasted and then do it, I just think you get a I, at least I've always gotten a better experience out of it. Yeah. Um it was definitely an interesting experience that I wouldn't mind trying again. Yeah. But I want to, like, I would go out to my little gym area on the outside, and I started, like, I needed fresh air at certain times. And I rode my bike for a little bit to see how weird that was. I was like, whoa, (laughs) riding the fucking assault bike. And I was like, hold on, let me go stretch and do some yoga. I think that was probably the coolest, like, felt really good to stretch and just be in yoga positions at that point. I was like, wow, this is cool. Dude, I have, so I'm glad that you said that because I wasn't sure if this is like, it was a me thing or if other people experience that. But when I, when I'm on them, I have this super, super heightened um, sense of my body. Yeah. Like where I'm able to like control and grip and manipulate muscles and joints and like in a much more deeper way than I normally can. Okay. Okay. And it was like, I love, I'm like in my body and it feels amazing. Yeah. Especially like, uh, did you look in the mirror? Sometimes I do. I try and honestly, I try not to when I'm doing that. Okay. I try not, I try, I stay, I absolutely stay away from my phone. I try to stay away from anything that could like, uh, I, I guess be like narcissistic. Right. You like look at you're on your phone, you're on social media. There's a certain like narcissistic aspect to social media, even just being on it and consuming it. You're being like affected by like this narcissistic energy that is on there. Yeah. And then also, I don't know. Facebook's like that. Looking in a mirror. Dude, they're all like that. Yeah. They're all like that. Yeah. Um, 100%. Yeah. Every single one, every single social media site is. it has a narcissistic uh, element to it. Yeah, I think so. I think we're all we're all guilty of it. Yeah, but I mean, like, wh- how did when did social media start? When with MySpace or before MySpace? MySpace was probably one of the biggest. Yeah, well, they had. I don't know. It depends, like, what you consider like a social media. I kind of consider social media AIM. AIM, AOL, uh-huh. AIM. I remember that back in the day. Yeah. You it was like the first to... like chatting. It was like an in, it was like DMs before DMs yeah. essentially. Yep. Just like send little messages. And then you could have, uh, you would have like a friends list. Yes. And you could this. go to click on your friend and they would have like some cool, like if the BRB banner. Yep. And they have like cool little I think it was designs. about like nine or eight at the time when AIM was around eight. Around that age. Uh-huh. But yeah, everybody from school would be like, hey, yeah, come get on AIM tonight. I'll chat with you. Chat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man. What the heck? That's what was, dude, my, so this was my username. You ready for it? What's that? Bad Boy Dan 67. Bad Boy Dan 67. <laughs> yeah. 67 was your football number? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very predictable. I mean, it could be your birthday. You look, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> No, but I'm just kidding. Well, that was uh, my first, my high school number yeah, I yeah, wore yeah. was 66. Okay. And mine that. Mine was at 65. Oh, okay. Mine was 65. Yeah. Yeah. And when then I went it, to college, I switched to 67. 67? Yeah. Okay. And then that was the number that, that was the number that I felt like, yo, that was my number. My senior year in high school, I was 70. Okay. You look like a 70. A 70? You look like a 70. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? What is that supposed to mean? So, 70 is dope ass number. 70, like you're like a big, just block, usually a goober player. <laughs> <laughs> that's lucky number seven. That was, that's on, awesome. So, honestly, I think that the numbers affect the way players look because certain numbers, especially on the back, depending on how they're shaped they can like make you look either narrower because you get them big ass I shoulder was a big pads block. on yeah you're right I'm uh-huh 70 block. usually they had the big seven number block seven number big block zero yep. number so you just looked like a box no on. no not no. a flattering dr number. phillips number uh didn't have the box ones it had a, a nice 70 look okay yeah so my, my 70 was pretty nice I can lie. The dark blue and white and the baby blue, powder blue that we used to wear. Okay. Some fire jerseys. 
Nike. No, I think it was Adidas at the end. So you guys had cool high school jerseys. We had some really cool high school. But after our years, them jerseys, they had some really nice ones. Okay. Maybe 2010 to like 2012, they got some super cool looking jerseys. So I know that, I know the gear, like ultimately like your jersey doesn't really matter when it comes to like playing, but there's something about having nice gear there that is like makes that. you want to play. Like, I don't know. It just gets you, it's like dressing up. Yep. It's like when you go out and you dress up, that yep. feeling you get, you feel great. When you have nice jerseys, it's that same way. Yes. You know what I mean? It's just like that. Oh, check me out. I got these, this cool, the sick gear, these sick gloves. Uh-huh. The colors look cool. Everything's tight and looks good. I look all jacked in there. Yep. Uh-huh. That's how it was for me when I played lacrosse, man. I had number 21 when I was, I played my sophomore and my senior year. And number 21, I've, I just, I just like number 21. And I just wanted to look super cool. You had these cool f- freaking the face visors. masks. You saw those face masks uh-huh. that we had. You had those long uh, deep holes. At first, they put me as a midi. But my big ass coming from uh, football, running back and forth. You have to play attack and you have to play defense. You running back and forth throughout the whole thing and trying to score. No, nah, di- I wasn't about that life. So I had talked to the coach and I was like, hey, uh, can we put my put me on defense deep hole? So they gave me a six foot what is it six foot poles? And that was fun. That was a lot of fun. Okay, you get to whack people with that thing. So what is this? Uh, so what? So you went from like essentially a midfielder to a like a defender? Yeah, it's just a deep hole. So you have your attack. Uh huh. I believe there's three on attack, three um, middies. And three deep holes. And then you have your goalies. Okay. So your middies can go and attack as well with your attacks. And your middies can also go downfield and attack, um, defend with your deep holes. Um, but your deep holes can, can't... You can go to the other side to score. A defensive player can go to the offensive side to score, but a midi has to stay back. Okay. You, you kind of get what I'm saying? Yeah. So um, it was a cool sport, man. It was definitely different. A lot of, ha- I got freaking hit in one game. I right should know more. Sport. I should know more about lacrosse. I used to, in college, I dated a lacrosse player. Okay. Uh, so I should know more about it than I do. I just never, I don't know. I never got into lacrosse. You could hit people, dude. Like, like football, just like football, you can, if that ball is on the floor, I can come up, and if they're going to scoop the ball, uh-huh. as a defensive player, I can come up and lay them out. <laughs> <laughs> and it was fun because, you know, I was a big dude coming in there, and there, there was a bunch of small, little fast little, little guys, but they, get, they can't hit. Right. They, were, they weren't players to hit. Well, but yeah, bro, it's, it's just physics. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, force equals mass times acceleration. Yep, you're right. Uh huh. Um, yeah, that's cool. I don't know. I feel like people play lacrosse that couldn't play football. Oh, come on. I played all four years in high school. <laughs> I tried to play college, but I was just damn it. I didn't love it anymore. Yeah. I didn't. I, I, went to, like, I went to a community college around here in Florida, and I just didn't like it over here. Uh, ended up messing up, wasting money over here. But you knew it was important. You knew that you weren't. Uh, you, you knew that you weren't into football after high school. After high school. Yeah. I, I kind of fell out of love with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I wanted to play, but I didn't want to I play. think that's important to know, though. I th- I th- like that's a great... I think sometimes people get locked up into the thought process where it's like they played... A, they did something in high school, you know, like in this situation, they played football, they went to college, and in their mind, because of the people they were around other football players, maybe they just expected to go to college and play football. Yeah. But think about, I mean, a lot of people, you know, football is the most popular game here in the United States. Yeah. Especially in high school. People love playing football. 
So there's like kind of like a status that like comes with it. So yeah, def- there's definitely. like a there's like a stigma to it. Like the boys, like you know, football you get to players. be around all like the um, big events in high school yeah. because the football team's yeah. always around there. You get to wear your jerseys in school mm-hmm. and look super cool. Yeah. On Friday night games, you know, everybody's like, "Oh, good luck today." They're Friday giving night lights, bro. Friday night lights, right. dude. That you would have we would have Panther moms that would give us like bags of uh goodies before our games yeah and then we'd have a team meal which would be it was fun yeah man it was a good time but it's important what i was my like my point to that was it's important though to be able to recognize you know you went to college and you started playing and you recognize oh this isn't like i don't really have the same passion for this that i once did yeah and instead of like wasting your time trying to like oh i gotta get through this or have to continue this because i started it or because of people looked at like people thought I should or this perceived status I would get from being this. Like you didn't let that shit trip you up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you kind of made a, an honest assessment of yourself and like made the next move according. Yep. And Which is an move. important skill to have. Yeah. To be Most able to definitely. recognize those traits and be like, oh, okay, this no longer serves me anymore and cut ties with it. Because it was just really hard. You know, I ended up moving out to California to go um, play Juco at Saddleback and just that whole process of going over there to play football, it was about 35, 40 minutes from my dad's house. I had a, I forgot what year, but a Buick, a little burgundy Buick with uh, these velvet seats, my dad's Buick, and it would break down on me. I had to get towed all the way home after football practice one time, and that sucked. And I just was just annoyed with that whole process. I wasn't making money. You know okay. what I mean? As, and I was just like, dang, I need to make some money somehow. And that's when it all came down to working at McDonald's. And uh, I worked at nightclubs in California as a bouncer. Uh-huh. And I would do side gigs as a Polynesian entertainer. I would go to houses that are having like little luau shows mm-hmm. with my dad. Or if, if not my dad, I'll have a, like a tape, tape player of some drumming. And I'll go over there and I'll spin some fire. I'll do some Tahitian dances. I'll do uh, audience participation at the end. And that was a cool experience because you get to meet all types of different people. You get to go to all types of houses in California. And you go to some really nice houses sometimes. Meet some really uh, big time people. You know what I mean? I yeah. did some stuff with Leona Lewis. Uh, who, what else? There was a music video that we were in with, I forgot what her name was, but it was a cool house music video that we did in Hollywood. We would do, I do shows in Hollywood all the time. And um, yeah, that experience brought me to like Tahiti and stuff. Did you always know you, did you always do that with your, with your pops? Yeah. Well, growing up, my mom, my, both my parents were entertainers. Right. They, uh, they both entertained around the world. My dad would go to Spain, go all over Europe and stuff like that. My mom's was in Tokyo. She lived in Tokyo Disney for four years. And then they ended up meeting each other in Hawaii and moving to uh, Orlando, Florida to dance for Disney World. Okay. So before I was born, and then I, I was born in 91. Um, and yeah, they, they were dancing there for a pretty long time. And then my dad moved back to California, and then I would go over there every summer. Every summer, he had his little gigs and uh, little shows, a little group. You'd go to California from Orlando? From Orlando to go visit my dad. Uh, And yeah, man. So you would spend your summers out in California? Three months in June, usually June, July, and I'd fly back in August. And that's when you would hustle out there? Yeah. 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 Work, entertain. With my dad, he hooked me up. But um, I'm... When I moved out there when I was 19 is when I started really getting into working and entertaining out there. Um, That's when I got to go to Tahiti. I got to be a part of a big group out there called Mm -hmm. Loke Over in California, they have a really big Polynesian community and they have really big events out there that they host. Entertainment's like a part of the Polynesian like... Yeah. yeah. Culture. Yeah, yeah. That's right? what like I grew it's up like, with, man. It's like embedded in there. That's it like is. what I've come to like learn 
since I've had become friends with yeah people with you know you and other people that I've become friends with that See, have had I, I was born descent. in Orlando, Florida, but the Polynesian community down here was so close together because they all worked at either SeaWorld or Disney World. So we all grew up with each other. We all knew each other. You know what I mean? Yeah. Basically calling everybody aunties and uncles. <laughs> all cousins. Oh, hey, there's my cousin right there. Yeah, my cousin. Hey, uh -huh. cousin, cousin. It's like that cousin. cousin that's not a cousin. Yeah, you, you know you know what I mean. Yeah. 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 I feel like everybody has a cousin that's not a cousin, and they have an aunt that's not an aunt. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so you guys just natural entertainers. Yeah. So it's like kind of in your blood. 100%. And that's kind of like why you knew that football wasn't for you anymore. Yeah, I just like I said, I I didn't I didn't love it. But you because you love something else. Yes, and I wanted to chase something else. I wanted to be an entertain. I love entertaining. You know, I mean, yeah. I feel like I'm an ent entertaining person. Oh, I know. <laughs> so <laughs> I know. But um, yeah, that's that's what draws me. So um, I ended up. Leaving California when I was about 21, uh -huh. my buddy flew from Orlando that I grew up with uh, to California. We drove my little Kia Soul all the way from California, uh, Costa Mesa, California, back to Orlando. We stopped in uh, Texas, Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas is really nice. I got to say that. Um, great I've been there a couple of times. I've had a, I, I, I like it a lot. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was amazing. I thought the barbecue over there was great. Yeah. Uh, we stayed the night over there and then ended up driving back. To they got great tacos in Austin, dude. Really? Like, they got taco trucks everywhere, and they've got some bomb-ass tacos. Mm. I like tacos. Yeah, bro. Is that, I mean, who doesn't special? like tacos? There's actually a Netflix special on tacos right now that I checked out the other day. Makes you want some tacos right after that. That might be my next cheat meal, bro. <laughs> oh, that see, that's what I'm talking meal. about. That's what we were just talking about the other day. Cheat meal? Yeah. Yeah. Tacos. I mean, for me, taco. you can never go wrong with tacos for a cheat meal. No. Uh, I mean, it's not that. Cheap. You got you can put some protein in there, some chicken. You got carbs on there, but you can put some chicken. Yeah. It's a cheat meal. I don't, I'm not. What, what do you put on your taco? What do you what would you, what do you want on your taco? Uh, I like ground beef. Okay. I like so I prefer a hard taco. I I like the hard shell. Okay. So I'm going hard shell, and then I'm going ground beef, mm -hmm. and then I like I like to have uh you know a little mix in there, a little green mix. And then I'll throw a little bit of tomatoes, chopped up tomatoes, chopped up onions, and some guac or. Er, I mean, it could be guacamole or it could just be avocado mixed up with that and just put it on there and then a little bit of hot sauce or salsa on there. Okay. I like Damn, that. You, you dressed that thing up. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know good. what? Oh, so this is a game changer that I'll, I'll put or dip, if it's a hard talk, I'll dip into plain Greek yogurt. Into plain Greek yogurt? Uh-huh. So I'm telling you, this is the hack. Because, like, if you like sour, because this is what puts those meals over the top when you're getting, like, Mexican food, yeah, yeah. any type of lad food, it's particularly, like, tacos, burritos. Like, sour cream, a dollop of sour cream, bro, on uh, on some tacos just sends it over the top and just, like, flavor and goodness. But it also yeah. sends it over the top and just, like, sitting in your belly, yeah, so it's just that taking too. forever to digest because you have like all these carbs and fats mixed together and you got a little bit of dairy in there. I used to love sour cream on my taco. Oh, bro. I used to love them. Uh, Taco Bell. Uh, what are the Taco Supremes? Crunchwrap Supremes. Oh, all them things. I used, oh, to, I used bro. to love Taco bro. Bell, dude. So I always tell people to this day that when they were like, oh, how'd you get so big? And I'm like, yo, my mom ate Taco Bell every day she was pregnant with me, which is a true story. She did. And I, I just tell people, I'm like, yo, that's why I'm so jacked. I'm so big. You know what I mean? That Taco I'm, Bell. <laughs> <laughs> I got that Taco Bell superpower. <laughs> but I would, so uh, before I like learned about <clears throat> nutrition and like got smart and like don't like took fast food and any processed food out of my diet, yeah. Back in high school, all what I was caring about was getting as big, strong, as fast as possible. 
and like just eating. Like I just needed mad calories. So I would just eat crazy calories. But like I didn't have like a lot of money. So I'd have to eat like I'd go to like Taco Bell and I'd get like the Nacho Bell Grande meal. Mm. I'd get like six bean burritos and then I'd get four hard tacos. I would crush all that shit after a workout. Dude. Damn, dude. <laughs> I would just tr- I would eat crazy amount of calories. Or I'd, I'd, uh, I had these, you could get them from uh, Sam's Club. There were these chimichangas, microwavable chimichangas. This is oh, like, I like chimichangas. This is some like fat kid shit, bro. This is like some <laughs> fat kid shit. I was like 17. And this would be like my go-to. Because like I didn't have my cooking skills yet back then. Okay. You know, so like I could cook an egg and like make a sandwich and like burn some chicken and shit. But like I wasn't, I was young. I was stupid, right? I didn't have those that great of cooking skills yet. So like, I was like, Oh, some chimichangas. I'm getting a quick 4,000 calories from these four chimichangas. And they'd be these chicken cheese chimichangas. And I'd put sour cream on that thing after a workout. I'm telling you, my cousin used to make some chimichangas back in the day. And every time he would make chimichangas, I'd go over to his house and I'd mess those things up. Uh huh. One of my favorites. Why do we talk about the Taco Bell? Because of Taco Bell. Oh, do you I remember that little ta- dog that used to be on the Taco Bell commercials? The little um, yeah, Chihuahua? The ch- yeah, a little Chihuahua. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I remember. Hey, man. So this is my go-to. I got to get this off my chest. So this right. is why I started telling the story about Taco Bell. Like, my, so my Taco Bell go-to order, though, like I would do when I was younger. I would do the Nacho Bell Grande after I'd get done lifting. Okay, but like if I was gonna get like my go-to meal there, is I would get. Three uh, Baja Chalupas, chicken Baja Chalupas. Okay. Then I'd get two Crunchwrap Supremes and a Nacho Bel Grande. Mm. And I'd get it with Mountain Dew. Yeah. That was my order, bro. That's my, that was like my go to order We're for over that here fourth meal. Taco Bell over. <laughs> huge right now. We are Dude, I haven't had. Huge right now. You're making me want to talk about it. Bro, I haven't eaten, I haven't eaten eat fast that. food in 12 years. So, 12 years. I'm just, Nothing. I'm literally, ro- no, no fast food. I haven't ate uh, McDonald's ever since I quit there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just don't like McDonald's. I think McDonald's is a very uh, unhealthy place i've yeah. seen how they cook their stuff i've seen their, like their french fries and stuff and it's just yeah bro dude, I, dude i'm telling you if this you can't though, make it yourself i'm telling you this though back in high school i used to go to mcdonald's with my cousins and the football team all the time my friends we would order like five mcdoubles five mcchickens oh damn oh yeah oh damn yeah i feel like that's some young kid shit that though. is that is that's like some young kid shit that's like especially dudes like you're like kind of eating out of competition too. Yeah. Right? You're dude, like, we used to go to wing night, dude. Wing night, dude. People were like, oh, I ate 100 wings yesterday at Gators. 100? Dude, one time I ate 104. 104. I ate <laughs> 104 wings, bro. The t- so a bunch of dudes went, like the whole team went to, it was like Quaker Steak and Lube. Okay. Uh, the unlimited wing night. And it just like turned into a competition. Of course. And then uh, I was like, I think I was I was like a sophomore at the time. And like mm-hmm. all the, like the juniors and seniors were there because like I was on the varsity team. Yeah. So I was just like trying to be like the young, like, yo, check me out. I might be young, but I can eat a lot of wigs. <laughs> Some just dumbass meathead shit thought process, right? And I remember just for no reason trying to prove a point eating 104 wings. Oh, man, that's a lot of wings. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, what, what kind of wings? Like you had different flavors? I was just mixing it up, dude. Because okay. at a certain point. You were hurting after yeah, that. Dude, I, bet, dude. I did not need 104. You know you were hurting right after that. You were like, damn, <laughs> I don't know why I ate all these wings, man. Oh, <laughs> yep. I know it. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a <laughs> stupid. It was a stupid move. Uh, but it's just like. What were you, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How are we talking about wings and wing night? Taco Bell. We went on a tangent. We yeah, went on we a went tangent. We kind of went off on a slide thing. But no, I know what you were talking about training, like training. Yeah. Entertaining, it being in your blood. And you were saying how just like knowing like that was what you wanted to do. Yeah. You wanted exactly to be an entertainer. To uh, that's why we moved back to California or moved back to Florida um, from California because... I was training to be a wrestler before I left. Mm-hmm. 
and I was just really overweight and very low confidence. Didn't know, you know, I mean, didn't know what I was going to do. I wanted to go to college. I went and I didn't know where my life was going to take me from there. Yeah. Um, I just, I was getting in trouble and I had to move with my dad. I had to get out of Orlando for a little bit. I grew up here. I was born and raised. I was here my whole life. I had to get out. So I moved out there with my dads and, um, yeah, that's when I got to experience everything that I did out in California, which was amazing. I, mean, I spent about almost two years out there, got to go to Tahiti for my 21st birthday and dance out there, which was really cool. Bora Bora and Papete. Wait, why'd you have to? So you had to move from California back to Orlando. Yes. Because you were getting in trouble. No. Um, well, I was working at nightclubs out there and stuff like that. My, I was just having troubles at home at the time and I needed to go back to Florida because I felt like I needed to go back to wrestling. Okay. I felt that was my calling. Okay. I looked at myself in the mirror one day after I started getting more in shape and um, because of dance and I was like, you know what, what am I going to do here? Am I going to continue to work at McDonald's? Am I going to continue to just do these side gigs? I need to do something more with my life. You know yeah. what I, mean? I've, I was looking in the mirror and saying, yeah, I need to do something more with my life. So I ended up driving back to uh, Florida and going back to my old wrestling school, the Wild Samoans Training Center in Mineola, Florida. And maybe about nine months after that, nine months after I moved back and started training again, I got a tryout with the Raw and SmackDown. Um, it was there. I was there for extra work, but they gave us a tryout at SmackDown. Cut a promo in front of William Regal, Brooklyn Brawler, and Byron Saxton. Uh, after that whole experience, uh, William Regal told me I had to work on my footwork. It was god awful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exact words. Um, maybe <laughs> exact words. He said, Everything's good, but your footwork is god awful. <laughs> At least I, said, I said, Okay. He was was like, it awful? Yeah, probably. Right. I was green. I, At I mean, least he I was, was honest green. with Yeah, it. of course. And that's this is where the story goes because about three four months later i had my tryout with uh at the performance center the three-day camp uh -huh. and that's when demont was still there bill demont was still over, over there um and i went through that whole camp and william regal came up to me and he said your footwork got a lot better whatever you've done is I can tell. How much time had passed? About three, four months. Oh, okay. So I was. I, so you I had a good training. amount of time to train. Yeah, I actually was picking up uh, this guy. Uh, what's his name? Bram he used to wrestle in TNA and some in other countries and stuff. But I would pick him up and he would help me out because he used to be at the Performance Center. So had you had any wrestling experience I before did. that original tryout? I did. Okay. I, I mean, I started when I was 17 in Florida. Oh, okay. Right after high school. I was going to a uh, community college out here, and I was attending wrestling school. I got, uh, I'm sorry, my, my story's all over the place. No, it's okay. But, like, uh, I ended up getting a scholarship out in Mineola at the wrestling school at the Wild Samoans when I was 17 years old. And usually people would pay $4,000 to go to this school and train there. Um, but I got the scholarship and started training there. And when I was 19 years old, I just, that's when I moved to California. Okay. I, I, I trained there. I got my um, little plaque that they give you that you graduated wrestling school. And I learned a lot through off of the Wild Samoan, a WWE Hall of Famer. Um, and a lot of the other guys there, like I learned a lot from them. Yeah. You know I mean, um, got to work little shows, but I didn't fully experience the whole indie scene. That was the only shows that I experienced was WXW. Um, then I moved to California and that's when I got to experience dancing and like, uh, go to try to go to college at, uh, Saddleback mm -hmm. and that just didn't work out. So that's when I ended up moving back to Florida, going back to Alpha when I was 22, and then I got signed with WWE when I was 23. Yep. That uh, helped you, the dancing? I think so. Right. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. think if you would have just stuck with wrestling from the jump, you probably wouldn't have had... Uh... 
Uh, I don't know where my life would have took me. You would have had, well, I, you just acquired more skills, right? You, you acquired more I experience. I did. I think it's important. The only reason why I brought that up is I just think it's important, especially for a gig like that, where you're like creating a like character or persona, like having actual real world experience before, like some people, there's some people that have like gotten in very young. And I feel like when you're young, you don't have enough real world experience to kind of like build something. Yeah. If that, yeah, I, I mean, was, you could I build, was young when I there, it's just, there's, there's a certain amount of it. Life experience, I think, is required. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think you're 100 percent right because I was super young. I was like 23 when I got signed. So like, and then also I was the WXW champ before. So I thought I was better than I was, and it all came crumbling down when I went uh, to the performance center because it just I started off with who savvy. Uh, he's never been in the ring before. Well, you yeah. just made it to like the the big leagues once you got signed. Yeah, right. And you're just like when you make it to another level, it you humbles realize, you. Well, there's just, <laughs> you just realize there's more levels to go. Yeah, you were like you were big dog where you were at, but now you're like in a bigger yard with other big uh, dogs. Way bigger and yard. And just like you have to raise your game, even if. But I was game, a fan of it. You know what I mean? Growing up, I was a huge fan of it, and that's where it kind of. I had to like figure it out. I was like, oh, I can't be a huge fan right now, right? What? Okay. Yeah, I had to try to figure this whole thing out. It was kind of weird at first, but it got interesting and it still is interesting, man. It's a freaking interesting ride. What, uh, what was the issue with like, why did you need to separate being a fan from being a professional? Um, if that's what you're, I guess I'm insinuating the professional part, but. I mean, I'm, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so like, I think if you're just a fan, a super fan of this thing, it's good. But in a sense that you need to be a professional, you need to handle business. It's a business I'm, I've learned that throughout this whole thing. It's you're handling your business. You are a product. I am a product. You know what I mean? Um, you have to know when you are a, a star. You're a star in people's eyes. And you're not one of these. You're just not an ordinary person anymore. I feel like fans are just... Well, they pay their money to come watch us, right? A fan come, pays their money to watch us, and they also love what they do, what we do, right? Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is I just think that um, I can't, I'm getting lost on this. I think <laughs> I'm getting lost uh, well, you, were saying, you were saying, because uh, we were talking about the difference between being a fan and like, and then, you know, separating your fandom from being an actual entertainer, like a professional wrestler. Yeah. Separating those two, it being that because you had been a lifelong fan and then now you're in the business, you were saying why you were separating it. Then the, the necessity to separate the two in terms of like being a good professional. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just think being a professional is like, Look at Michael Jordan. He, he loved basketball. He was a fan of basketball. But when, he came, when it came down to work, when it came down, when it came down to work, and when it came down to uh, being in games, he was out there to hurt people. He was out there to dominate. To win. To win. Yeah. You know what I mean? Look at Kobe Bryant. That's my hero. Um, he, he had a love for basketball. He was a fan for basketball. I mean, you can still have them together, but when it comes down to playing basketball against these people, he was out there to win. He was out there to dominate. He was out there to score on everybody and show people who the hell he was. And you would know who Kobe Bryant was, right? Because he would always make a scene when he would score on people. And they were Kobe Bryant. Right. You know what I mean? Anybody's a big star. Name a big star. 
they're fans of the the craft that we do i'm still a fan of the craft that we do i still study but at the same time when it comes down to it you have to be a professional when you get in that ring yeah 100 percent. well once I, you hit that curtain yeah you have a so you have that like yeah that's the mentality you have in terms of performing oh yeah i think that's what i've been watching a lot of like documentaries like kobe and michael and just a bunch of stars and stuff like that and that's what i've seen they've all had the love for it even big artists i mean they have that love for the music they're fans of themselves i um I'm almost been I've been thinking about because you brought up Michael and I've been thinking about this for quite some time but some I think that uber and maybe it's different from performing neither it's it's different from being a, a performer and then being an athlete because the athletic part there's like a like a known competition yeah right but in Entertainment, I mean, there there is competition within entertainment. But I almost am wondering, are, are we robbing ourselves by adding competition to performing rather than just enjoying the performance itself? And then, because I think in that process, by not having uh, this competitiveness of trying to be better or than someone else or invoke more energy from someone else you're just focusing on you being in the moment there's not nothing to taint your intention to be in the moment mm -hmm. and i think sometimes that ego in the competition or in the performance takes away from it yeah and it's just something that i've been thinking about and watching i i'm watching the last dance documentary okay i know i'm late to the party but uh, it's on Netflix. Yeah, so I that. watched it on Netflix. I think sometimes that mentality, like we covet it and we we uh, glorify it, but I don't know if that's the right. I don't know if that's the right behavior to glorify. Michael. Yeah, because I get being competitive, but I don't know if you can be. There's just like a respect and like there's just times where you can when you're that when you have that persona and you have that you're acting that way like I'm going to be the best and I'm going to demand that everyone else rises to my level and if not like I'm going to let them know and I'm going to do my thing and I'm like the top dog there's like this I don't know it's just not very respectful mm -hmm. to people and, in, and if you're a team player I think you can alienate people right yeah. and your like ego gets in the way of like other people you're it's just too much ego and i get it like i come from very ego fit like i've been in a football locker room wrestling locker room i get it it's just like all ego in that place but i think if we all could check our egos even a little bit more i mean a lot more but even just a little bit more i think we could all be happier in said competition you know mm -hmm. i think some of that uh can kind of it robs you robs you of the joy of the moment robs you of of enjoying the fruits of your labor as well just from my experience yeah, yeah. and so sometimes i think it's detrimental to encourage that and i see a lot of I see a lot of people that weren't very successful athletes, but I've seen some some successful athletes as well reiterate that thought that that's how you have to be as a competitor. You have to have that mindset. That's kind of why they like dog on LeBron. He doesn't have that killer mindset, but it's like, no, nah, he's just kind of mindful and respectful and like he knows he has it and can like elevate his guys without having to, yeah, I, I like LeBron. I like LeBron. I think he's 
He's amazing. That's what I like. That's what I like about him he's a, the he's most is his leadership thing. abilities. Yeah, it's just different. He has a different approach, and it's it was a, in my opinion it was like a breath of fresh air. <clears throat> I I appreciated that. So yeah. I think it's important uh, for like younger dudes to know that that you don't got to be. You can still be competitive. You can still give max effort. You can still be a dog, you know? Yeah. In air quotes, for those of you who are listening to this. Air quotes. Uh, And still be respectful. True. Towards people. And not let your ego... Because then also being kinder, because when you have that, you're not kind to yourself. You're just you're very you can be very hard on yourself. Yeah, which is a double edged sword. You need to have. But I think all artists are pretty hard on themselves. Yeah, for sure. At some point, you know, I mean, everybody wants to have a really perfect picture, but sometimes it doesn't come out that way all the time. But yeah, but also um, Bruce Lee was one of my heroes as well, and I know it's one of yours. You got a picture up of of him. Uh huh. Very wise man. Yeah. Yeah. His philosophy. Yeah, that's what I was a big fan. I was a big fan of like his philosophy. Okay, I was a big fan of his acting. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> growing up, I, I, I loved it. I loved Bruce Lee. Yeah, yeah, his eyes would tell a story when he'd get mad or when he'd lick his blood and he taste his blood and he gets crazy. He just something about it was just super attracting when I was young. He was very animated. Yeah, everything's big when he would move his hands. And he was freaking cut. Yeah. I mean, he was he was jacked. Yeah. He did cool shit. Yeah. I liked his, uh, I was just, hit the be water, my friend quote, mm-hmm. to me is just like, I don't know, I remember the first time hearing it and being like, it blowing my mind. Which seems kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe that sounds extreme now, being like a blew your mind, but I remember just being a young kid and reading it and be like, oh my god yeah <laughs> yeah did you watch that bruce lee documentary which one there's one on uh what is it hbo be like water it was the be like water uh documentary um i don't know if i did it's i've seen cool. i've watched so many of them yeah that i like watch them all every yeah. time there's one that comes out it's pretty cool it talks about his family and his uh up upbringing and stuff like that his mom and dad and his all his brothers and sisters so yeah it's just his life was interesting he'd have been a great pro wrestler you think so oh yeah for sure oh dude he would yeah most definitely yeah are you get you're getting ready to make a comeback i am i am uh been out for about what is it i've got surgery march 14th i think our our my last match was with you uh-huh. The six well, man. you had your labrum repaired? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I had five anchors put inside of there. Um, How'd you tear it? Uh, I was taking the clothesline in the six man with that we were in uh, uh-huh. over the top rope. That's right. And I was coming down. My shoulder hit the apron pretty hard and swoop, popped out. And I could tell right away. I remember you came up to you like, yo, Kona. What's up, man? You good? I'm like, <laughs> that's I'm right. They're like, nah, dude. I think yeah. I, I think my shoulder's out. I was like, bro, what are you doing? <laughs> you gotta, you gotta get to this next, this nah, next spot. I could, I was, I was lost. It was, but I, we finished the match. Yeah, we did. It didn't. It, <laughs> <laughs> I just remembered what that match was. Um, this guy. But when you, so for people who aren't aware. He took a maneuver where his back was to the ropes and someone clotheslined him over the ropes to the floor. Yeah. And in that process, there's like a said kind of, I don't want to say technique, but there's, you know, when you're used to maneuvering in a wrestling ring, like if you're a professional like we are, you learn how to move in that thing and like make yeah. things look the way you need them to like look. I've, I've taken it like that so many times. And I've never done that. Like, never hurt myself doing right. that. But just this time, it just whoop. And, yeah. That's the thing, though. Like, the ring is moving. It's always moving. So, sometimes it's not where you think it is yeah. in terms of, like, your 
whether you're an inch closer, or inch far away, that like could mean a lot. Yeah, it can throw off your sense, especially when you're getting cartwheeled over. Essentially, yeah. <laughs> so just the ring is dangerous in itself. Yeah, but I mean, like this shoulder has been pretty. It hasn't been a hundred percent for the longest time. Before I got hurt, uh, when I was just starting actually wrestling. Uh, I don't know what I tore. I think it was my labrum. I tore a small part of my labrum in the front and back. Yeah. But I just never got surgery on it. And they said if I did physical therapy over the years, it'll get stronger, but it won't ever fully heal. But I never got surgery. And it felt fine. I wrestled all my like five years, five and a half years in WWE with it. And then all of a sudden, yeah. So, uh, but you're healed up now. You had surgery, rehab, yeah. which has kind of been probably a blessing in disguise. Yeah. The craziness that's like going on in the world and not definitely. like you weren't really needed to work. Exactly. Uh, it so was the kinda, best time to have this surgery done. You know, I mean, I wish I didn't have it because I feel like I would flo- uh, flourish uh-huh. right now. And how they're filming Raw, SmackDown, NXT because there's no fans in there and there's all these people. I feel like my entertainment would flourish in this environment. Okay. Because you get to see more of me. You know what I mean? You get. You mean with no fans? With no fans. Yeah. You get to actually hear me talking in the ring. You get to see who I really am. You know what I mean? Um, that's what I. That's what I think is really cool with no fans in there. You get to really see somebody come out and you get to hear them talking um, on TV because there's not many fans screaming. They're not making much noise. It's more intimate, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, it's a weird experience. with it. It's really weird with, the, with us out there as fans, but, I mean, it's necessary. You know what I mean, but it's pretty cool. I, I enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> banging on the glass. Y'all, sometimes I'll get into it, dude. Okay. I'll go over there and I'll start banging on that glass and I'll make some like beats on that thing. Doom, 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 doom. And then Bugenhagen over there yelling, hey. He's crazy. That guy's crazy too, dude. He's insane. You see his Instagram? No, I haven't seen it recently. Oh, he's been hanging upside down, playing his guitars. It's hanging upside down. I don't know what this guy's is going. Just going crazy. Yeah. <laughs> that man's a maniac. He's a maniac. <laughs> crazy dude. Um so you're looking forward to coming back. I am. I am looking forward to coming back. Getting back in the ring, getting after it. They said about maybe a month from now I can probably start getting back in the ring and then 2 months I'll be cleared. So I've just been on the grind right now, man. I imagine this time off, though, has probably been... Uh, Healthy? <laughs> well, a time to reflect. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Probably had... Good to heal, but also good for your mind to, like, get into a different perspective. And then just to get a different perspective of performing because sometimes when any job that you're in it for a good bit of time, if you can get some time away, when you come back, you have like a different perspective. Then I just like, I feel like this past year, everyone's done a lot of like deep work. Yeah. Introspective work. People have found out a lot of things about themselves this year. Um, These turn of events have really tested people. And I imagine you probably, I mean, we're all kind of going through it together. So yeah, I imagine you've, you've gone through quite a bit and then having this time off from work as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, for the first two months when I got hurt, I just kind of, I was doing so good with my nutrition before I got injured Uh that once I got injured, I was just eating whatever. And I would do that for about two and a half months. And I could see a change in my body like that. And I was like, oh, man. And I would beat myself up uh, about it for a while. I was like, damn, man. I, look, I would look at the pictures of myself when I was in shape. And I'd be like, damn, I wish like 
should have stuck with it. I should have stuck with it. But then, you know, talking to you as well and talking to other people, they're like, yo, just eat your, eat whatever you want. Enjoy yeah. yourself right now, man. You have, you have time. Yeah. I, so I think it, I was just trying to tell you, it's crucial, especially when you're healing, you've got it as an athlete, as a <clears throat> performer, you got to get that out of your head in terms of like what you think you should look like comparing yourself to your best all the time. Yeah. Cause it's like, you're hurt. You're not at this moment in time. What is necessary for you is to like, to get calories so your body can heal. Cause there's a healing process. The healing process requires a lot of calories. So feed your body. Then also in like our profession with entertainment, there is this, uh, this pressure to always look your best yeah to always be ripped and jacked and in the best shape possible and then you're training all the time and you're not getting any time off so there's like no time to really ever take you know take your foot off the brake mm-hmm. so i think when you get that opportunity to take you know or take your foot off the gas when you get that opportunity to take your foot off the gas and put your foot on the brake take advantage of it for your mind, you know, as yeah. your emotional health, you, you know, it's important to do that. And it's it's easy to get wrapped up. And I'm only talking about that from experience. Like, I, it took me a while to, to be easier on myself in those situations where, like, yo, I'm injured or I have a, 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 I'm out because of this. I need to not really worry about all these things that I would normally worry about. Ease my mind. It's okay to eat something that I don't normally eat, eat a lot of calories to, to put on a little bit more body fat than yeah. what I would normally have. I don't need to be 7% body fat all the time, 10% body fat all the time. Like it's already tough enough to do it as long as we're doing it. Mm-hmm. So I got a little bit of time. It's okay. I'll be okay. I know how to put when it's time to, to put the foot back on the gas, you already know how to how to get there yeah because you already did it yes and and that's what i would tell myself it's like listen you put in the work all the time putting the work in is not going to be the issue don't you it's okay eat this relax just focus on the shit you can control and that's exactly what i started to do you know i was doing that for so long and i was enjoying myself i had i had some good stuff had uh as you should bro i had some really good food at that time um, I was going to Burger Fi when I was in my accident. I was hitting Burger Fi. That Burger was my, Fi. Burger Fi was my go-to. Oh yeah, Burger Fi is great. I'm a I big Burger Fi fan. I love Burger Fi. I love pizza. I'm a big pizza person. Yeah, I love Italian food, sushi. Yeah. I, was, I was doing it all, man. But just but you were saying it done. You weren't feeling good. I wasn't feeling good. I could tell like my body. It affects your was mind. Changing it affects your mind. Not you eating good. Feel your body. The way you would get more lazy, I would say, when you eat right, when I eat right, my body feels energized and I'm ready to take on a day. Yeah. When you don't eat breakfast, when you don't eat, get your nutrients in the morning and stuff, you feel sluggish and you just don't feel like you want to take the day on you. I mean, so that's why I got back. Once I started getting back on my diet and started getting back on my sleeping schedule, sleeping better. Things started changing. My mind started thinking better. Uh, drinking a gla- glass of water every morning with lemon in it. Mm-hmm. And just having a routine that you you go to every single day really helped me um, get back into it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause, yeah, getting everybody's, I feel like everybody's routine is jacked up right now. Yeah, because you, of everything going on. What are, you, can we go to this place? Oh, but you got to wear your mask. Right. Sometimes I'll walk out and I'm like, oh, shoot, I forgot my mask. You know what I mean? And you got to walk in a store and it says mask required. Right. But, yeah, man. Uh, feeling. So the feeling with your mind as well. Yeah. Like the food affecting your mind. Yeah. It's like eating and moving gets you, gets you right. Yeah. A hundred percent. So I've been feeling pretty good lately. Um, shoulders getting stronger. Uh, been working out five to six days a week lately. Been going to yoga. Yoga's helped a lot. Hot yoga. Definitely been a game changer. Um, I try to go at least two to three times a week. 
I know you're a big yoga fan too. Yeah. You practice yoga a lot. It's been a game changer. You you, you helped me out with that. So I'm happy to help, dude. Yeah, you know, man. I'm just trying to. I like to just. I remember you was like, "Oh yeah, I go to hot yoga. I go to this place." And then I found out there was one right by my mom's place down in Doctor Phillips. I was like, "Oh, cool, yeah." This one's pretty nice. Been going over there, and all the yoga instructors are really cool over there. Very nice. Well, yoga just like, especially for what, with what we do, just in general, I think everybody you should train your body on as in as many different ways as possible. You should train, you should lift weights, you should run, you should jump, you should do isometrics, plyometrics, you should you should do stretching, you should do mobility, you should swim. You should literally do all the different movements that you can do. Yeah. Push your body. Yeah. Do it doesn't everything doesn't have to be like a workout. Everything doesn't like a workout in the sense of, okay, I'm gonna use these dumbbells and I'm gonna use this this rack and this machine and there's other ways to train your body and i just yoga in particular for me one of the benefits more than just the physical aspect because that's that's awesome but the it teaches you how to breathe properly and like to because most people don't breathe properly most people have terrible breathing patterns they're mouth breathers they don't breathe deeply into their diaphragm it, like something happens where we just like forget how to breathe and i'm not really sure why but yoga teaches you how to like breathe and like with your movements like your breath controls the tempo your breath controls when you sync breath and body together it's just like you become superhuman breath is like the foundation of like all movement yeah and you take that. That helps teach you how, you know, there's other ways you can learn how to breathe, but yoga is just a great one. It's a great one that just, like, I didn't even know I was learning how to breathe. I first started going to yoga because I was like, oh, I, it was good. It was stretching. And it was like, you know, it was healing for your body is what I heard. It's really good for your body. So I was just looking for stuff to add into my routine yeah, to just make it better. And I was like, well, let me give this yoga thing a try. Like I'm down to try everything once mm -hmm. and I did it and I like, I loved it because it was like hard, but I felt good afterwards, but I was only looking at it from the physical aspect. But then once I learned how to, uh, I didn't have to look around in the room anymore to be like, am I doing this right? Or what is this? Or what is that? I could focus on being present and then that's when the breath kicked in mm -hmm. and then that's when like the meditation aspect of the practice kicked in and that's really when it like changed the game for me in terms of not just my yoga practice itself but into the rest of my like it rippled into the rest of my life and just, uh, the big big thing was breath yeah yeah i was having a hard time when i first started going i was just like oh my god this is this is tough you know what i mean because i mean it was hot in there mm -hmm. and you can't do, I couldn't do every single position that they were trying to do. But after a while, you kind of start to get, you, like your body starts to get used to it. And it starts to feel good when you do it. And breathing, like you said, it just comes along with that. So, it's like anything you get. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Yeah. You're not going to be good at it. I mean, I don't know. There's not really too many things you just do for the first time you're good at. Yeah. But I, I enjoy going to yoga now. And it's been a, a routine of mine, at least twice to three times a week. Yeah. I love it. I love it, too. Man. I need to go. I'm trying to go tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. I need to go tomorrow. I got some physical therapy tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, man. I got some legs I got to train tomorrow. Ooh. Yeah. Leg day. Yeah. Yeah, man. So, I mean, everything's been pretty good. Just been working, working out. What are you working on? Um, I've been actually learning how to play guitar. I've been trying to get musically inclined. Yeah. <laughs> like with my piano and stuff like that at home. Um, just been hanging out, cruising, dude. Waiting for that, you know, to get back in the ring. That's that's the one thing I get whenever we go to these Raw, SmackDown, and NXT shows. And I watch, and I sit there and watch. And I've been there for six years now, dude. 
like, oh, about to be six years in October. And I'm just like, damn, I want to get in that fuck. I want to get in that ring. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because that's where the bread is at. <laughs> that's where the bread's at, dude. Yeah. Um, well, dude, I mean, performing is awesome. Yeah. I, I, I just miss it. Yeah. I miss it. There's, there is something about performing in front of a live audience that is unlike anything else. Yeah. Especially when you're, when you've got a good partner that you're in the ring with and you guys are vibing and you guys have a good. We've traveled, we've traveled a lot of places together. Yeah. For, for what, four years? Four almost, months? almost five years. Yeah. Almost five years. So, I mean, we, we've been to different states. We travel, we've uh, entertained in front of so many different fans in different states. That's been crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It has been. Like but Dion, when you get in front of the crowd and you like you get <clears throat> you know, you put together a story and you don't know if the story like you, you know, you have an idea that the story is going to work and people are going to be invested and they're going to bite or you're going to build suspense or you're going to shock people or you're going to make people laugh depending on like what kind of match you're having. But when you plan it, like, you know, I mean, you have an idea, but you don't know until you do it. And every crowd's different. And when you get out in front of a crowd and you get them to actually re react to the things that you wanted them to react to, because you, like, weaved a story through, you know, sports and violence. Yeah. It's just, like, it's just an amazing feeling. Yeah. You know? It is. I mean, I grew up an action movie um, fan. You know what I mean? I loved action movies. And this is real-life action right here. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're putting on a real-life action fight. Well, then the connection <laughs> with the audience as well. Yeah. Right? You get the like, you get the, their energy. You do. You feel you their feel energy. It. When, they're, when they're either booing you or they're cheering for you and they want you to yeah. beat this guy's ass crazy well it's like a synergistic effect because like you're I like you're word, synergistic synergistic effect synergistic. you're uh, orchestrating it you know you're initiating the things to get emotions out of the crowd yeah but then they feed back into it and like the more you give the more they give and it becomes like this feedback loop and if you're doing it right the thing just magnifies and it's just that's that's where the magic is yeah you know I know. <laughs> we know. It's a, it's, it, you know, it's one of the cool parts of the job. It is. And that's why I'm just, I'm ready to get back. So you've been working music. You've been making beats? Uh, no, not yet. You haven't been making beats not yet? yet, dude. Or you are going to start making beats, I want though, right? To. I want to. Want to, yeah, okay. I would like to. So is that like your next mission? I think so. Okay. Yeah, I've been talking about it a lot lately. I'm ready to yeah, start making some beats. It's, I mean, I, I grew up with a whole bunch of music around me, different types of beats, you know what Yeah, I mean? you play the ukulele. I played the ukulele. I played the toy for a while, but my dad's group, I grew up um, going to all these groups and stuff, listening to beats. I love music. I yeah. think music is amazing. I mean, so there's something about music that can put you in a mood, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You hear the words of something that can put you in a mood. It's just... Music, raw dude, emotion, like magical, magical. So, I mean, I love music. I think, I think, the world runs around music too. The music scene around here is just, just getting bigger and bigger, right? Mm -hmm. Don't you think? It's just now the entry level to music is anybody can get their music out to the world because the world is so connected. So we're able to see. I think music's just always been such a huge part of human beings. But I think now with the connectivity of everybody, we're able to just see so much more. So people are putting out so much more. And I think with like technology, there's all these like cool devices that make it easier to make music or make different. Like now there's so many different, you know, before electronics, you just had instruments. Yeah. But like now with electronics, you have so many different subgenres of like music you can create mm -hmm. with a synthesizer and and 
all the different equipment out there. You know, you could get a soundboard to do the craziest shit. Yeah. I've seen some pretty cool stuff out there. It's almost like you have to be like an engineer. Yeah. Like some of these like big electric beat makers. <laughs> <laughs> Those little boards. Um, you know who's really good at making beats is Justin Sua's kid. Oh, okay. Jerome Sua. I've seen I've seen uh cuz he'll, he'll post stuff of of yeah, yeah. I think that's super cool. Yeah. He's really good. He I've been watching good. his look. very talented. Yeah. All his his whole family is very talented. What uh You training tomorrow, dude? <laughs> <laughs> I got to go to physical therapy at 10 and then uh I would like to go to train right after that. Yeah. What are you training tomorrow? Oh, I have a list of what I've been training, dude. I've been following this little workout plan. Wherever my phone is at. I think it fell on the floor. No phones on the show. Come on, dude. Oh, sorry, dude. It's a rude. But can't yeah. remember from the top I of your head? I can't remember, dude. I bet he used to, uh, I had this nutritionist back in the day. He was sending me workout plans. So he has a whole bunch of, I've been going to the emails and looking okay. at all his stuff. Just been following all that. So you got a trainer. Yeah, you like you like the work you like this particular plan he's giving you. It's pretty, yeah. I think it's pretty good. Cool. It's been a lot of high reps. I've been doing really lightweight, and it's very um, a lot of negatives and really slow movements and really controlling. Yeah. Instead of me having to do a lot of um, like crazy ass powerlifting stuff right now. Yeah. You, I mean, I'm trying to stay away from like cleans or anything like that. I couldn't squat for a while, but my range of motion got a lot better. Um, yeah, the one thing that I was trying to focus the most on is my range of motion. And I'm about 90% right now. Yeah. So. Well, that's good. You've, you haven't been uh, letting what you can't do keep you from doing what you can do. Yeah. You're doing the eccentrics, like the slow eccentrics to create, uh, just increase the time under tension. Yes. So that's how you like increase intensity without increasing load. Yeah. That's what you were trying to say. Yes. Uh, about the weight. And I've been doing a lot of supersets as well. Jumping. That's a good thing for people because a lot of people don't realize that, especially early on in their training career, is you don't have to lift, like lifting heavy is important at times at the right time but it's not the only way to get stronger it's not the only way to build muscle there's like a you know all you have to do is increase intensity and heavy weight is one way to increase intensity yeah there's other ways to increase intensity reps uh rest periods you can shorten rest periods that increases intensity you can increase time under tension how long you have a particular weight in your hand, you can make the the rep slow, like a five count. You know, you can pause. Yeah, you can pause at the bottom. There's so many different ways you can add intensity without adding weight. Yeah. And I think uh, when you like know, it's important for young people to know, especially young dudes, they want to lift heavy. Yeah. You yeah. don't have to lift heavy. Lift heavy, it's important to lift heavy, but be smart about lifting heavy. And you don't have to lift heavy every day, all day. Yeah. So I, did, I wish I knew that back in high school. <laughs> yeah. Back in high school, it's like, yo, you got to lift heavy, man. You got you to gotta throw these weights as much as you can. So. You got to lift intensely, but you don't have to lift heavily. Yeah. But yeah. You're 100 percent right. Like I can't, I can't do much right now with my upper body. My upper body strength was really depleted after that time. Yeah, yeah. Didn't do nothing for three months. You know what I mean? So right now it's it's starting to feel good, and I'm starting to get power. But everything has to be close in. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So yeah, to, to kind of mitigate the stress off your but this new gym shoulder labor. Yeah, this new gym that I just checked out. Uh, What's that gym called? I forgot what the gym was called, man. Rivals. Rival Athletic. Okay. They have a whole bunch of different machines there that it's really cool. I saw you post that on your Instagram story. Yeah, I was like, yo, dude. 
Those are some dope machines. They have those uh, those big uh, slam balls that we had at the PC. Okay. That go up to 150 pounds. Oh, really? Yeah, they have those. They have a little room over there with a, with one of the, a rack. I it's miss good. those things, dude. Me too. I, I did love. Too. That's one of my favorite things to do is to get a big like slam ball, heavy slam ball over your shoulder, 150, 200 pounder, grab that thing. I like to just walk with it. Okay. I like lift it up. I'll do some body weight squats with it and then I'll hold it high on my chest. Okay. And then like I'll walk and I'll just clamp down on my, on my abs. I'll bring my rib cage down and just flex my whole core and then squeeze it. And then I just walk for distance and I just try and make that thing as heavy as possible. But it just like makes your core so strong love it it's one of my favorite core exercises nice and it blows you up yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> those things blow you up i think i like doing exercises where i'm getting uh i'm getting like str- either some sort of strength training or like muscle hypertrophy in while also doing cardio at the same time because mm. like you don't have to just do like you don't just have to get ride a bike you don't have to just run or jog on a treadmill to do cardio there's other ways to get cardio in train like aerobically and anaerobically there's other ways to do that than just get on a bike or a stairmaster or this or that yeah, yeah, yeah. you do it within your training of course just intensify it yeah and it speeds up your workout it no, speeds I'm, your I'm workout always, up. these workouts that i've been doing i've been d- drenched after yeah uh, yeah that's good it's been really good yeah i like the supersets i'll jump from one machine to the other and it's been it's actually been kind of crazy because the supersets when i'll go to like the other day we did quads and calves Mm -hmm. and i would be jumping from like squats front squats to like three five sets of nine super three second lowering three second negatives to um leg extensions five sets of 20 five sets of 25 okay and just kick those out Shoot, they're burning. And I just started doing abductors a lot more. And whew, yeah, feel those things. Uh, they're fired up right now, dude. <laughs> what were you know. doing to train your abductors? Those, you know, that little machine they got there. Oh, the, the chick machine? Ha <laughs> <laughs> dude. The chick machine. You know you use it. I do. Dude. I do use it. I, <laughs> I do use it. Abductors are important to train. Yeah? I, well, why are they important to train? I was wondering. They're your stabilizing muscles. Like, they help stabilize. Like, your, they control a lot of the balance in your leg, especially unilaterally. Okay. So, like, which you're always on one leg if you're in motion. If you're running, if you're doing something athletic, you're usually on one leg all the time. So your abductors, you have your abductors and your adductors. No, adductors are on the inside. Okay, adductors are yeah. inside. So think the inside, ad, when you squeeze them together, you're, that's addition, right? Yeah. That's how I remember oh, them as okay. the adductors. And then the other ones are abductors. I don't have a thing for the abductors. I have a thing for the adductors. But that way I know Got adductors you. and then the opposite one's abductors. Okay. Yeah. Understood now. Yeah. <laughs> I knew it was one of them there to add. I used ab- to pull, especially when you're a taller guy, you have usually you can like can have more issues with your adductors. Really? It's common. So if you're a taller dude or if you just have long legs in general, taller women as well, your adductors are super important for you to train because usually taller people have like lesser balance and they have weaker adductors. So you need to like really train those things. Uh, yeah. Yeah. These things are sore. Right yeah, now, dude. I did. I think I did five sets of 25 the other day on that thing. And the, one of the things I do to train them other than just doing that machine, because if you don't have that machine, I'll take like a big ball, like a yoga ball. Okay. A Bosu ball. And I'll put it between my legs. And I'll like sit on a squeeze. bench and I'll squeeze it for like 30 seconds. And that'll be a wrap. Oh, wow. And it just like, it's a great exercise. Okay. Thank me later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Listen, thank, to, me, thank later. me later. Ladies, thank, thank me later. Fellas, y'all should do it too. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Don't be afraid. You got to get them. Plus, that's how you get that. That uh, When you really train those, those adductors, that's where you get that inside leg muscle. And it matches when you get that big teardrop too, yeah. bro. You see that together. That's that sexy leg, bro. <laughs> I'm telling you, chicks love a dude with big ass legs. Yeah, I, I it's an aphrodisiac. 
Yeah. I've been Big ass that. legs or aphrodisiacs? Yeah. So, trust me. <laughs> I trust you, dude. I said, trust me. I trust you, dog. Yeah, man. I've been, I mean, I can't do much on upper body, so I've been really training my lower body. Yeah. And you got a good set of wheels on you. Yeah. You got a good set that's of what wheels I've, on you. That's what I've heard. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people say, hey, man. People just some, been coming up to you. Hey, you got some good legs. I said, wow. Well, well damn, you've been looking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for Pretty sure. Good set of legs on me. That's all right. Check them out. Let me know. Tell me. <laughs> Check these wheels. I'll oil them up. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's funny. I'll oil them up. Only, <laughs> it's like pro wrestling and like uh, models. Cocoa like, butter. Yeah, cocoa bodybuilders. Butter. You like butter. oil your body up. Yeah. You got to, I mean, cocoa butter. You got to cocoa butter. Oh, body. dude, it. it you got to ha- moisturize. Right? So one, you do need to moisturize. Dudes out there that ain't lotioning and moisturizing their skin, I'm telling you, don't be t- don't be tough. Okay. Trust me. Lotion your shit. Yeah. It, your skin is your the largest organ in your body. There, you should be taking care of it. Yeah. You 100%. should be taking care of that. Hygiene. Thing. Hygiene. Yeah. Hydrate that thing. Hydrate. Take care of it. Exfoliate. Treat your skin good. Okay. And then keep it moist because that's how you're gonna stay young. Yeah, you keep that skin healthy. It stays. It it keeps its plasticity. <laughs> the plasticity, and then it stays nice and tight. And that's why you like you'll look good as you get older. But you yeah. don't. You get all old and wrinkly, and you age and shit, and you just look like a prune. And then you're definitely, <laughs> definitely <laughs> not. Nobody's into that. No, no, definitely not. That's why I moisturize after every shower. <laughs> <laughs> a must that's a that's a must yeah me too i use a dude i use a good bit of shea butter shea butter that's my go-to now shea butter is good yeah you gotta watch out though why if you wear it with a t-shirt it can stain your shirt oh, okay i use a very i so i don't really have to i i just because you don't oil it's the oil that will get in the shirt you just yeah yeah but i use like sometimes i don't use like i don't like not, I won't cake a layer on like I do when I'm, uh, like wrestling. if I'm going out to wrestle yeah, or yeah. perform. I'll just put enough on, especially for my face and my head. It especially because I shave. Yeah. My, after I shave, because like shaving is like exfoliating. You like exfoliate all that skin while you're shaving. Mm-hmm. Then after you get out of the shower, it's usually super dry, so it will suck up anything that I put on there. So I'll just like put that shea butter. My skin will like absorb it. You got a shiny head. I got that. That, that shape about her head. I'm aerodynamic. <laughs> I'm aerodynamic. Put me in the wind tunnel, bro. What they call you Mr. Clean? That's right. Mr. Clean. That's hey. right. <laughs> oh, man. It's crazy that you we've known each other for five, what, over five years now? Mm-hmm. You lived in Orlando for about five years now? This is the longest I've lived anywhere. Yeah. In quite some time. Yeah. Like maybe the longest ever. You enjoy Orlando? It's okay. Yeah. That's all right. Okay. It's not, to be honest, it's like my least favorite city I've lived in. <laughs> Why is that? There's just like no soul here, bro. No soul? There's no There's so- magic, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's a magical place. I'm telling you that. I, so I don't, so I'm not, I haven't been to any of the parks. Oh. Since I've lived here, I haven't been to any of the parks. Not even Universal Studios. I haven't been Nothing. to any of them. Wow. I haven't been to any of them. Dude, we're the entertainment capital of the world. I know. Maybe that's why I don't like Orlando because I haven't <laughs> gone out and experienced yeah, the parks because that's a lot of people here love the parks. Well, right now, I mean, the parks are safe. My cousin actually, she's been going to uh, Disney World a lot and doing these little Instagram bl- vlogs. Of the parks, and she said there's been a lot of changes. It's been it hasn't been packed. You have to wear a mask all day. Mm-hmm. Um, and she said there's like those dividers, those plexiglass dividers, and all of the lines and stuff like that. But she said it's cool. She said it's actually a lot better right now because there's nobody there. Yeah. The lines for everything are like twenty minutes, 
15 minutes. Maybe I'll maybe I'll go out there. <laughs> maybe I'll, go, maybe I'll there. go out there. I mean, dude, if you maybe I'll vlog. A, <laughs> maybe we'll go out. Maybe we'll go work out. We'll vlog the. We'll vlog a trip. We'll vlog a workout. We'll vlog Disney. You yeah, like uh, Disney? I'm not trying to go when it's hot though. Okay. I've been there, I've been there too many times. When it's hot, it's not fun. Maybe we will go to Universal. Yeah. Let's go to Universal. Universal's fun. I'll go on that. I want to check that Avatar. Check Avatar's at Disney. It's at Disney. Yeah, it's at Animal Kingdom. Okay, maybe that's where we're at. <laughs> <laughs> it's, at it's at Animal Kingdom. That's really what I want to see. That's all that I really care to the see. The Avatar. Though. Yeah. Yeah, Avatar. I love sick. Avatar, dude. Yeah. The ride is actually really sick. I went on there with um, my family, and you sit on the what is that thing called a banshee? Mm -hmm. You sit on a banshee thing like this chair. It's three D, right? Uh, there's two rides. I believe this, the Banshee one is 3D. You put it on, I guess, some goggles or something like that. And you can feel the Banshee, like you're riding on it and it's going crazy and you can feel it breathing. Like the, the seat that you're on yeah. is moving your legs. So like, it's really cool, dude. It's, it's really sick. Hell yeah. Usually it's a long ass wait. So it's giving you the sensation as if like you're, you're on, on the actual Banshee. Dra yeah. Yeah. A little you flying can, creature, yeah. dragon creature. Exactly. Disney's pretty good with all this stuff, man. I've heard good things about the Avatar exhibit, so and I'm a big Avatar fan, so I'm trying to yeah, man, trying to ride the Banshee. Ah, there you <laughs> my go, big ass. <laughs> my big ass. My big ass. You say, uh, excuse me, sir, you can't sit on the Banshee. Oh, what? what? You discriminating against me? <laughs> <laughs> You're too big. The Banshee can't hold you. It's messed up, dude. <laughs> he says, stop, dude. Stop, dude. Then that's what they try to tell you when you're uh, trying to, or when you were jumping out of planes, right? When you're skydiving, telling me what that you were too big at first. Yeah, that's what a couple of uh, the like training centers around here, because there's a shit ton here in Florida of uh, skydiving. Yeah, here in California, have the most because of the weather mm. and. I was trying to find a place that would like train me, teach me how to skydive. Yeah. And they didn't, <clears throat> once they found out how big I was, they just were like, no, nah, sorry, I can't help you, man. Cause you have to per pound, you go like cubic centimeters for the parachutes, like area surface area. Okay. For like the rate of speed in which you're going to fall for like resistance. Like I can't have just, you and I wouldn't wear the same parachute because of the, our weight difference mm -hmm. and its its ability to. What is you know, the what is the weight limit for someone to jump out? Well, there isn't a limit. It's the limit is is whatever the parachute is. So, like I was weighing, I weighed when I was jumping, I weighed two ninety. Oh, okay. So between my body weight, two hundred ninety pounds, and then the book bag, which or the backpack, the rig, which was probably about 40 pounds. I was like 330. Mm -hmm. So I had 330 pounds that was like falling from the sky. So I had to have a 330 cubic centimeter parachute to learn on so that my rate of speed wasn't too fast. Do they, they make those um, type of parachutes? Well, they're usually Something made for tandem flying. Okay. So like where they have the instructor. They have like the bigger parachutes for that or for special forces. Mm. A lot of the special forces guys will have to have big ass canopies because they're falling out of the sky with a hundred pound uh, rig on themselves or they're carrying an extra payload. Sometimes they'll be jumping out with supplies for set like mission that they're on. So a guy will weigh 400 pounds. So they'll have to have a big ass canopy for that. Oh, wow. So I actually was using so long to get to the parachute that I ended up tracking down because 10 schools had turned me down and like training me. And I was like kind of feeling defeated. I was like, damn, really wanted to do this. I had made my mind up at the time that I was going to start learning this new skill. Yeah. And everywhere I was going was like turning me down, shutting me down. So I was like, all right, this sucks. I was kind of sitting on it. And I was like thinking about it. And I was like, dude, I want to learn this. Like I, I got my hopes up. Like I thought I was about to do this. 
And then, you know, I reached out to, you know, seven or 10 schools and they all turned me down. But like, that can't be it. There's got to be a way. I was like, how do I figure this out? Well, I remembered, like, I have a friend, Jeff, who's a Navy SEAL. And I just was like, I'm going to hit up Jeff. I bet you if anybody knows how to get this done, Jeff's going to know how to get this done. So I hit up Jeff, told him the situation, and he directed me to this school in Florida called DeLand Skydive. And they train, like, all the special forces okay. there. And then a lot of the pro teams, like the pro skydiving teams, come there. It's, like, arguably the best school in the world to, like, learn how to skydive. Nice. And they were like, he was like, if anybody's crazy enough to teach your big ass how to fly, they're there. So I was like, oh, okay. I hit them up. Sure enough. They were like, yeah, we'll take care of you. I didn't even call them, actually. I just drove there because they were only, like, 50 minutes from my crib. Okay. So I drove, drove up there, talked to the dude in person, and they're like, yeah, man, uh, we don't have any shoots on site that would, that would work for you, but I'm, I'll make some calls. I'll get back to you. Four days later, they called me, and they were like, yo, we found a rig for you. So, like, they had rented a rig from somebody up north because it was, like, winter time at the time. They didn't mm. need it. So we rented a, this big-ass 330-centimeter uh, rig. It was, like, a – it used to be a military rig, but it was, like, brought over to the civilian sector, and mm. they, like, turned it into a single shoot. So I was, like, able to use that. So that's how I was able to learn how to skydive. And you jumped out by yourself, right? Yeah. Mm, nice. That's crazy. Uh, so the, <laughs> the, the first I went, I had to go through a, like a course, like a program. It's like, I had to go, I had to learn, like I'd spent a day learning all the equipment, like the procedures, uh, the walkthroughs, everything, like all the stuff that you could learn on the ground. Like I had to learn that they have like an instructor that would like teach you to like get quizzed and all this shit. Then the next day was the first jump and the first jump in the accelerated free fall course, you would jump out by yourself, but you would jump with two instructors and they would be attached to you when you would jump out of the plane and you had to like, you'd go through the process of when it was your turn to get to the door, get to the door, you would measure, you do all your measurements, figure out where, uh, the, like your targeted landing zone was because you have to keep track of all that in the air so it's like okay this is where we are this is where the wind speed is that we had calculated when we were on the ground this is where my sight is the fir the jumper before me has now jumped out and has been free in free fall for at least five seconds so now i know i'm clear to jump so i don't end up in his like in his jump zone at all yeah and then there's like a way to exit the the plane and get out but like two guys will be grabbing onto you onto your leg because you'll be wearing like a suit and they'll grab on there's a harness on your leg and a harness on your shoulder and then each guy will have one on the other side and then you jump out on your own and then you jump out and then they're there to control you your first time in case you're not able to do you lose control or you freak out or all the different things that could happen being a first time jumper and then you do that for like seven jumps, but each time, like the first two times, it's with two people. First two jumps. Okay. Then the third time, you jump with one instructor. Then the next time, you jump with that instructor, but he's not attached to you anymore when you first jump out. Then the last two jumps, you're basically jumping on your own, and he's just out there to make sure that you can do all the maneuvers, the basics. So there's a lot that goes into this. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. I would think so, man. You're jumping from a plane... You have a parachute on your back. I mean. Yeah. Well, you had, so like the, the most important shit is obviously like your equipment, right? Having your equipment, knowing how to operate your equipment properly. Yeah. Cause like your equipment is your life. Yes. What if this that breaks? What if one thing breaks? You have a backup, right? Yeah. You have a backup, but like the, I mean, they're expensive. Like the rigs are like anywhere from five to like $11,000, depending on how big they are. Oh, wow. Like they're expensive. Like you're getting like a high quality piece of equipment. Yeah. You just have to know how to use it. And then like there's when you jump out of the plane. So there's like three parts to the jump. There's the climb, right? Which you climb up, you jump out of the plane, right? There's that. There's the jump. Then there's the free fall. Then you, you free fall. Then it's time. Once you get to, you know, about five 4,000 feet altitude. You have, like, a watch on? Yeah, you have an altimeter. 
and which calculates like your altitude. Okay. So like when you're a beginner, you want to pull your shoot at 5,500 feet. But as you get more like skilled and advanced, you can like drop to like 4,000 feet for just, it gives you an extra five or 10 seconds in free fall, which free falls fun. Yeah. So that, and five seconds is not five seconds in real time. It's different. Wait, so you get there in five seconds, you said? No, it's like usually in 60 seconds. But the difference between falling at or pulling your shoot at 55,000 feet and 4,000 feet is an extra 10 seconds almost. Mm, okay. So it's like that extra 10 seconds, is you can do a lot in 10 seconds. Wow. Didn't think of that. Yeah, time's different when you're falling. <laughs> it's different when, when you're falling, falling out of the sky bro when you're falling out of the sky at 140 miles an hour or faster yeah that's crazy dude. time's different you just feel that shit coming out of your face. well you don't you're so singularly focused on falling like on your body position because you're not just like willy-nilly falling through the air like there is a position in which your body needs to be so that like you can caress the wind you, you essentially turn yourself into, like, an airplane. Like, when you learn how to, like, use your surface area to control the wind and move your body around, you turn into, like, a little airplane up there. When you get good at it, you How can does it like, feel, like, on your, on your body when you're falling down? Like, how does the wind, like... It depends on if you're resisting it or not. Does it feel like something... Pressure against yeah. your... Yeah. Like, a lot of pressure? I mean, or the weight. looser you are, the less pressure you feel. Okay. The more pressure you usually feels when you're when you trying to fight the wind. Mm. You don't want to fight the wind. You want to surrender to the wind. Okay. I've been. I've always wanted to go skydiving. I've never been skydiving. Before. Dude, it's. I think. I don't know. It's not for everybody, but it's an experience that will change your life. Yeah. And yeah. not to be melodramatic, you know, and be like, "Oh, it's going to change your life." It just it provides a different perspective of the world um you gain a relationship with like the wind the air mm. the sky as silly as that sounds that you would never have being on the ground until you like fall through the sky you don't understand like that connection with the sky yeah that you have it, it seems like granola and woo woo but it's real yeah it's it's re it's real and the state of mind that it puts you in because I don't know if there's anything that can get you that singularly focused. Like you're not thinking about anything else. You're only thinking about where you are right then, right now in the moment. Yeah. And to me, that was just, I don't know. That was, it was just, in, it was invaluable. It was better than any drug. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it was, it's cause it's very peaceful. Cause like after, you know, you go through that experience and the rest of my day, like I could, when I would jump, like uh, the rest of my day was just so easy. Nothing could bother me. Like there was no stress. Was there a time of day that you would go in the mornings or something? Yeah, I would go. I would always go early in the morning. Okay. I'd try and get it. Cause you don't, you don't know what the winds are going to be like later in the day. Usually, if you go early in the morning, you're getting some jumps in. Nice. There you go. Yeah. When's the last time you've been? It's been a while. Yeah. It's been too long. I'm, like, working on getting a parachute. Well, That's you're a lot lighter now, dude. You're not 290 anymore. <laughs> I'm, not that, <laughs> I'm not that much lighter, dude. Like, what, 270, 265? No. <laughs> no. I'm 280 right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> listen dude i'm training differently right now yeah i'm my body right now i'm doing all i'm doing a lot of fitness shit yeah I, i've been watching your instagram videos i've been trying to just keep my body i've been trying to be this is the first time in 21 years that i have not had to rush to get back from an injury mm -hmm. rush to be training to like be at like peak pinnacle performance yeah 21 years dude 21 years so i'm like just trying to you know just trying to be kind to my body 
trying to love it right now. Yeah. I'm trying not to beat it to shit. Yeah. Because it's been good to me. Yeah. I'm trying to be good to it. Of course. So I'm just just doing some fitness stuff that just keep how, my anaerobic how long has it capacity. Been since your car accident? Uh, it'll be four months on the 28th. On the 28th? Yeah. All the scars pretty much healed up. Yeah, everything is just about healed up. I mean, everything is healed up. Yeah. Um, I still have that gnarly ass scar on my head, but that's probably gonna be there. Yeah, it's not going anywhere. It he- it's healed exponentially, like tremendously. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'll put a picture up of it. I'll do a side by comparison, a side by side. Okay. Four month. Yeah. Like, here's the difference. Because, <laughs> dude, it's it's healed. I've healed like Wolverine. Like Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> Bullets falling out. And I've I'm I'm I've been happy with how I've been healing. I've yeah. been treating my body. It's it's been a good it's been a good process. It's been humbling though. This whole experience has been very humbling. Yeah. I can only imagine. Um but it's been good. It's been like I've learned a lot about myself in this process in these past seven months. It's been like X, you know, I'm always trying to learn about myself, I'm always doing like that introspective work if I can do it. But like it, this year has like forced me to just really go deep, like deep, deep. And it's been hard, but I know when the smoke clears, the blessings will show course um that's how i felt the same way with this injury just i felt like uh it was a setback because i was doing so well yeah uh you're in a groove i was i was in a groove i was feeling I i was feeling it you know what i mean and then all of a sudden bam i got hurt but then like you said this whole quarantine just started the whole covid19 just started at that time so I got lucky actually with my surgery because if I would have waited another week, I probably wouldn't have been able to get that surgery for, I don't know, months. Right. And I would have been sitting out way longer. So I got, I got in there, got it done. Like I went in there to get checked in or checked up on. They said, um, you can do it the next tomorrow. Actually. I was like, Whoa. Yeah. That was quick. I'm going in tomorrow morning to get it done. Yeah. We have that or another month from now. I was like, uh, yeah. let's do it tomorrow. Yeah. Let's get it done. Yeah, man. Yeah. Don't even wait with that shit. Just get it over with. Yeah. yeah. Going from that's, that's another thing. Like going from peak condition, like sh- being in full stride, feeling good, everything going great. And then just hitting some adversity that's like, you're just dropping off a cliff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's, you know, like I said, it's a humbling experience. It is. It's just like, yo, you're not in control. You know, everybody has this thing in their head. They think they have so much control. It's like, you're not in control. Uh, Sometimes things happen that are out of your control and you just have to, you got to put your your ego, your pride to the side, and you just got to surrender to the situation. I think that all came to me right when I was sitting on that bed ready to go and get operated on. I was just sitting there. I was like, damn, man. I thought I was like, I, I would never have to get surgery. I, you know what I mean? I never had to go through this, but I'm going through it right now. Check yourself. Yeah. Check my ego right there. Yeah. It's good. Even though it sucks <laughs> to go through it because it, it's never easy to go through uh, like Being put to oh, sleep, hard situations. You know what I mean? Situations that are out of your control. Yeah. Situations that do like check your ego. Like they're tough because you like you don't have control. Yeah. And you have to just like focus on the things you can control and just accept the process. 100%. Because if you accept it, it's gonna it's gonna go along easier. Yeah. You're gonna be in a in a in a more calm collected state to be able to make good decisions throughout the process because there's going to be a process of bouncing back yeah and then if you're fighting it and you're feeling anxious from being out of control or something you know something's got you on tilt 
because you are no longer in control and you're resisting that. You're not able to say if an opportunity comes or or a said moment for you to take care of. You might not be able to make the right decision because you're not in the right mindset. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. So we're just getting back, hopefully in two months. Hey, oh, dude, I'm super excited. I'm super excited for you. Uh, I've seen a lot of growth from you over these past seven months. Uh, I've seen you do your thing. I know it hasn't been easy, but I think when everything gets back to normal or whatever normal is, when you get back to performing, I think everything from here on out is going to, I'm really looking forward to seeing I appreciate that. what you're doing, bro. Cause I've that. seen a lot of growth from like personally, you know, yeah. as like a man, not just like a performer as just like a man. And I'm just like proud to be able to be your friend and see it from a distance. And I'm just looking forward to you doing your thing bro oh yeah dude i appreciate you for bringing me on this show man this is this is awesome like i've been wanting to do this for a while i've been seeing a bunch of other friends come on here i've been seeing a bunch of your other episodes and like i said we we've been riding together for five years riding to these shows like all over florida you know what i mean uh -huh. you coming over to my place parking the car i coming over to your place parking the car we going to Ocala, we were going to Daytona, we we're going to St. Augustine, Jacksonville. Jacksonville, all over Florida. Venice. Then we get on, hop on a plane, and Milwaukee. then we go and ride all the way to Milwaukee and California and Vegas and all these places together. And you build bonds with people, you know what I mean? It sucks to see growing up, it sucks to see other people go different ways, mm -hmm, different directions, di different directions, people that you've been with and you've known and you've grown to a uh, connection to. But at the same time, it's really cool to see different venues, avenues that we're taking. You know what I mean? Where where are we all going to end up? Yeah. But you know what? Right now is where I, I'm, I'm enjoying myself. I'm loving where I am right now. I'm loving the mentality that I have right now. I'm loving the, the drive, uh, the motivation, the confidence that I built over the years that I've been here. Yeah. I feel a different way now. You know what I mean? When I walk around, I feel like, yeah, I've been here for almost six years. I've been doing this for almost six years. Well, you're learning who you are, too. I, yeah, 100%. I feel like when I had my blonde hair, when I was doing that, I was, I was in a character crisis uh, with myself, identity crisis. I didn't know who I really was. I was lost in a, trying to be somebody I wasn't. Okay. You know what I mean? We're just exploring, trying exploring, to find, exploring. trying to find characters. Yeah, find find character in my but with myself as well. Trying to find character in myself and figure out who I really, who I really am deep inside, like with growth. Yeah. You know what I mean? What I mean, like evolving. How do, how am I evolving throughout these years? And it's it's cool to really sit back now and look at it, dude. Where are we at? Um, an hour 44? Yeah. Hour 45? Yeah. Good? Yeah. All right. Uh, well, thanks for being on here, dude. Thanks for being on the show. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> what, uh, where can people find you at? Uh, people can find me on Instagram, Kona Reeves, WWE. Or you can find me on Twitter. Or pretty soon, two months, you'll see me on TV. Um, NXT. Yeah. USA Network. USA Network. Live on the USA Live. Network. Okay. Cool, man. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for being on the show. and uh, Thank you for having me. Uh, we're going to get this workout in tomorrow. Okay. Let's do this. All right, bro.